minutes or a few seconds, I should say. It's setting up. Okay. Great, we're live. So I'll just give it another 10 seconds and then I'll start intros. Welcome everybody to this live healthcare panel. I'm Dr. Carrie Arnold and I'm very excited to be hosting this session. I am the program director for evidence-based coaching at Fielding Graduate University. So for those who are alumni and current students, if I've not had a chance to meet you yet, I'm very glad you're here. And for those who are listening to this after we've been live, I hope you walk away with some really valuable information. We are recording this, and so it will be available on the Attendee Hub. And I wanted to uh, just take a moment and introduce our panel, and then we're gonna move into some questions. And for those who are in the session, there is an opportunity for you to put in your own questions, and we'll be monitoring that, and we will bring your questions in throughout the session. We do not have a formal PowerPoint. There's no slides to share. This is just, a lot of interested and invested people um, connecting and meeting with some experts in the field to have a conversation that's very relevant and needed. And so let me first introduce Roland Lyons, or Lyon, I should say. I always add the S, Roland, but Roland oh, is <laughs> he's one of many lions in my life. Roland <laughs> is a senior vice president at Kaiser. and. He's going to bring a perspective that is a little different in that he understands systems and he understands the system of healthcare delivery. And he works in California where uh, Kaiser is, is residing, like it's, I call it the mothership, but I'm sure Roland has a much better term for it. He um, has an MBA and his business mind and his understanding of healthcare is just going to lend so much to this conversation. I can't remember the first time I met Roland, but I have always been just impressed with his understanding of big picture and his ability to manage details and to really understand all the complexity of healthcare. I'll let him do a more deep introduction in a few minutes. I also wanna introduce Mary Shepler, who is a Chief Nursing Officer of Evergreen Health in Washington State. Mary has over 34 years experience in the field of nursing. She is working on her own doctoral degree in nursing, and she understands the frontline experience probably unlike any other. And so I'm very glad to hear a little bit about her perspective and how she can help us understand what's really going on in hospitals and what's really happening in the field of nursing. And then our third panel member, who I'm delighted to introduce, is Dr. Jen Dell Ellen Davis. Jen Dell is, by trade, an OB doctor, and she has over 25 years experience, and she practiced for multiple years. She has worked as a vice president also at Kaiser, but she is currently the CEO of Craig Hospital, which is here in Denver, Colorado, where I reside, and it's world-renowned. And she has not only the experience of being a physician, but she has the experience of seeing healthcare from many different perspectives and as a CEO. She's also been recognized as one of the minority leaders in healthcare to keep an eye on. And so I just wanna give all three of you a very warm welcome. I'm so pleased that you agreed to be part of this panel and to help us here at Fielding as scholars, as students, as practitioners, as coaches, better understand what it really looks like to be partnering with those who work in this field. So Roland, I'd love it if you did maybe, a, I'm gonna let each of you take about five minutes. I'll start with you, Roland, and then Mary, and then Jen Dell. Say a little bit more about your experience. Awesome, glad we're saving the best for last with Jen Dell. Jen Dell's awesome. Um, so Carrie had noted, I'm with Kaiser Permanente, and, and as we were preparing for this, uh, she wanted us to introduce a little bit about our roles. And honestly, when somebody asked me, what's your role? I start with, well, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and as of four months ago, I'm a grandfather, which uh, honestly, and here's a better picture of, of a grandbaby. She's all bundled up, ready to go for a walk. Honestly, I, I see those roles as being the most important roles I can play, and, and, and I'd include in that, um, I'm a 
member of a neighborhood. So I'm a neighbor and I'm a member of many different communities. And I look at healthcare as a place where I can go, where I can practice the, the place I play in all of those roles as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather, as a neighbor, as a community member, because healthcare brings that all together. So I'm privileged to have been working in this field now for 30 years. And my my it goes quickly. A little bit with my background, born and raised in Arizona, I uh, have an undergrad in economics, was working towards a PhD in economics and decided I didn't want to go to academia. I respect those who do, but I figured I just couldn't, I probably couldn't deal with the whole getting on tenure and all that, all that would require. And, and so I got out into to business in healthcare, and then I got my MBA at, at UC Berkeley along the way. So I've held a lot of different roles in healthcare, including I was a management consultant for my first 10 years. I worked at St. Joe's Hospital in Arizona, where I led the strategy and business development functions there. And then I was asked to join Kaiser Permanente, who had been a client of mine in the 90s. I joined KP back in 2002. And I, I had roles in the Northern California region, at the time our largest region, always kind of in strategy and business development, some in finance space, mergers, acquisitions space, but all of it really oriented towards how do we create a different delivery system where quality and economic incentives are aligned as opposed to maybe the fee for service world that our industry has struggled with and is transitioning away from. So more towards a, a, an integrated, a kind of a prepaid system where our, our um, those that have Kaiser Permanente insurance are members and they pay dues. They don't pay insurance premiums. They're literally part of a, a club where they pay dues and our objectives are to keep them healthy. And, it, and as we do that, that drives our bottom line as well because there's less expensive claims. And, and so our incentives to keep our members healthy, uh, to invest in preventive care. And then when we do get sick, when pandemics do hit, to do all we can to ramp up capacity to meet those needs with the highest quality outcomes. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the core of, of what I get to do, which is, which is wonderful. And then in Colorado, I held a few different roles. Uh, ultimately, I was asked to serve as the president of that region. Uh, many challenges in healthcare, as we all know. And two and a half years, I was asked to come back to Oakland, which is our mothership, California. We're headquartered in Oakland, where I, I lead a team that evaluates kind of where is healthcare going? Um, so, so I'm the senior VP of delivery system strategy, and that includes capital planning and all of our, our capital investments. And therefore, my, my team is investing in multi-year assets that enable those that are providing services and delivering value to our members to have the spaces and tools that they need to do their jobs well. So any investment in a hospital or a medical office building or a piece of equipment, including technology, is what I've got teams in all eight of our regions who are kind of trying to keep track of what's going on in the industry. How might technology enable us to really shift care towards, towards these devices as opposed to bricks and mortar devices? And then how are we assuring that we're, we're investing in those assets of the future and, and not creating too much capacity, not creating a deficit of capacity, but really trying to, to, to um, hit that equilibrium. I like to say it's Goldilocks, not golf. We're, we're not trying to get the lowest score we're trying to get it just right. Uh, and so my team does that. We in, invest about four billion a year in capital. So it's a pretty substantial you know, amount. Um, one last thing with Kaiser Permanente, those that may not know the organization, we are, we are seen as the country's kind of preeminent integrated prepaid incentive aligned organization in, in the healthcare industry. We have 220,000 employees and that includes 60,000 nurses and then we have a mutually exclusive relationship with about 24,000 physicians that exist throughout our, our different markets. So for example, in Northern California, the Permanente Medical Group is our, is our contracted mutually exclusive partner and Kaiser Foundation Hospitals and Health Plan is a nonprofit entity that I get to work with. So we're large, if we were publicly traded, you'd be about Fortune 40, maybe Fortune 35 now, given our revenue base. So we're large, but, but we have lots to learn still. We have a nonprofit mission. And like I said, it's been my privilege to work now for Kaiser Permanente. For, I'm in my 20th year, actually, with KP. So a little bit on my background, a little bit on my role. I hope that met your needs, Carrie. Absolutely. Yeah, it just also shows us sort of the complexity of just one aspect of this system we call, um, we call healthcare here in the Western world. So thank you, Roland. 
Um, Mary, I'd love to turn it over to you for just a little bit more around your background and experience. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. It's my honor to be here uh, with you and uh, the folks out there. Uh, as Carrie said, I actually came from Colorado as too. You'll notice a trend here uh, is uh, I started out as a young new grad. I worked most of my career in one organization, which is very rare, until I moved here up to the Pacific Northwest uh, 18 months ago. And I call that my repotting journey uh, to regrow and to uh, grow as a human and as a leader, et cetera. So I spent most of my career at uh, Exemplar or SEL Health. And so SEL Health was, is a nine uh, hospital system with a big medical group, uh, home care, hospice, all of that, uh, that I worked there and started out as a new grad nurse and ended up being a CNO at their, uh, their, their mothership, their, at their main hospital of St. Joseph in downtown Denver. And what I've learned in my career is that's a journey, right? And in that background, I've done critical care, informatics and quality and safety, which has allowed me to do all kinds of unique and gives me a different perspective on everything I do every day, especially that quality and informatics uh, or IT background. Um, it, it allows me to think a little differently. As I said, I moved here to Evergreen Health uh, about 18 months ago. And so uh, not long before the pandemic hit. And so uh, it's been an interesting transition and happy to tell more of that story as we get into the nuts and bolts as part of the gift and of uh, what's happened here. But Evergreen is uh, a two hospital system of where I garner the nursing care and patient care provided at both hospitals. And so um, I get to lead as well as oversee. And so the expanded role actually also has expanded my look. Um, we also have a big home health and hospice a program as well as a, a medical group, et cetera. So um, the transition has been growing and like Roland, I have uh, a beautiful family that live in Colorado and two grandchildren as well. So um, I think that is part of what keeps us balanced as healthcare providers, whether you're at a corporate level, a hospital level, or CEO, it's what keeps us uh, uh, grounded in the work we do as well. Um, they all seek uh, healthcare at some time, so we want to make sure it's the best healthcare possible. And I am just finishing up my doctoral uh, program of where my work is actually in resiliency and burnout and resiliency in clinical leaders. And I am passionate about the middle manager group because their impact on outcomes, whether it's employee uh, engagement or in turnover or patient satisfaction or in safety, or even the organization's finances, those mid-level clinical leaders, if they are not operating at their best, uh, certainly can impact all of that. And so I am close to finishing up that work. And so I'm excited. Wow, that's, that's what I know. That's, congratulations. <laughs> I don't even know how you do it all. So i um, so excited to hear that. And, and congratulations, Roland and Mary, on your grandbabies. Let's not forget the importance of the legacy that you are leaving behind. Lots of little lions rolling around. And, and Mary, I just know how... Um, how much you love and cherish your daughters. So it's just great to hear um, the growth there. Jan Dell, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a more deeper introduction now. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, this honor and privilege of sharing the stage with my buddy, Roland, my friend, Roland, who I call Bro-Ro and have for years, we work together on the same team. So. I'm Jandell Allen Davis. I'm the CEO and president of Craig Hospital, which is actually, as um, uh, um, Carrie indicated, is a globally and nationally. It is a nationally renowned neuro rehabilitation hospital that specializes in acute rehabilitation of uh, traumatic and acquired spinal cord and brain injury. And so, you know, as I sort of think about how to tell a deeper story, um, for 25 years, I took care of women and delivered babies and had that incredible privilege of doing that for the first part of my career. And then this last 11, in fact, it was 2009, so I guess it's getting on towards 12. Um, it'll be in April. I um, married 
uh, delivered four babies at St. Joseph Hospital on a Friday afternoon, my last day in clinical practice, even though by that point I was only working two days a week, two days a month in clinical medicine on labor and delivery. Uh, packed up my locker and the following Monday um, started on Roland's team as a, as a peer and a colleague of his as the vice president of government and external relations and then over a little bit of time picked up um, research as well at KP. And um, people ask, my goodness, how do you go from practicing medicine to doing that, let alone how do you go from being an obstetrician gynecologist to doing government external relations and research for Kaiser Permanente to leading a hospital that has nothing to do with delivering babies, although I keep telling them we're gonna do one one day, <laughs> Craig. Um, and what I simply say is doors open and you walk through them because the reality is none of this is gonna be on any of our tombstones. That is the things that we've had the opportunity to do. Um, and I think what I've learned is just to be very much present. And I love just soaking in new knowledge and new opportunities to make things better and new systems better. I've been at Craig about two and a half years and Mary, much like you said, I started October of 2018 and not even 18 months later, found ourselves, we found ourselves in at the start of this pandemic and it has been a wild ride that I know we'll have, I hope certainly some time to talk about lessons learned and um, sort of what that experience has been like. Um, in addition to that, what brings me joy is I've got a 33 year old daughter and a 30 year old son, bummer, no grands. Um, my yeah, daughter is in New York City. My son lives with his partner in uh, Florida, uh, married to my college sweetheart, Anthony, who we met in the seventies at Dartmouth. And uh, um, I was uh, just on a call for one of the boards I belong to, um, the Denver Botanic Gardens and was chatting with one of the, actually the arts uh, and exhibits leader and said, what's kept me in, you know, amongst a lot of things whole this year has been art. I, I'm a fiber artist and I don't know where all that came from, but have done that for a number of years. And in fact, just put two quilts in a show at Children's Hospital a couple of weeks ago at an exhibit that they have. So the fiber art brings me uh, great joy and I do a lot of um, community service on boards and Roland, don't fall off your chair. My newest um, appointment is that I'm on the Denver branch of the Federal Reserve. Oh my goodness, oh, you can do it all, Chandel. you I can just, do it all. It's, it's just amazing of all the wonderful opportunities that uh, life throws your way and just stuff your imposter syndrome away and keep working every day is what I say. So glad to be here. Thank you, Carrie. Well, you've all alluded to it. And so I think it's really important just to jump right in. And, and for listeners, you know, I spent 20 years in healthcare before I made the transition to executive coaching and, and academia. And when I was in healthcare, everything kind of revolved around joint commission. How do we stay in compliance? You know, how do we make sure that costs are down and delivery is what it should be? And I was more on the administrative side of things, but as I've been reflecting on what it must be like to work in healthcare, um, especially given the events of last year, and it's not just that we are in the middle of a pandemic, we've been in the middle of political unrest. We've been in the middle of a lot of protests. We've been in the middle of a lot of racial um, tension and, and watching what's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. Like, so all of these things intersect and all of these things show up. And, and Roland, you mentioned how large Kaiser is. And Mary and Jandell, you work in large organizations and large organizations are always a microcosm of what's happening in society. And so I'd like to kind of move into the question of how was 2020, and we're far from over. I'd like to think, you know, that this is just an extension of 2020. 2021 has not actually begun yet. So how has 2020 been a gift? And how has 2020 been a very mean teacher? And I'll let you kind of respond to that based on what's true for you. And maybe, Jandel, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with you and we'll go backwards. How would you like to react? Well, I think that, you know, it's interesting you call it a gift um, and it has been a gift and we um, reflect on that regularly with the about 30 leaders from in terms of who are um, directors of different departments throughout the hospital, let alone the over a thousand employees who I have the 
who this wonderful tool has provided the opportunity to have a regular way to um, uh, communicate with. And I'd say that's probably one of the first gifts. We've spent this last year since standing up an incident command last March 13th um, and tried to work our way through, you know, something that we knew very little about and having to rely on the wisdom and needing to luckily working in a place. And I, I like to think serving in that kind of manner anyway of relying on the wisdom of the teams and um, sense making as Carl Weick talks about in terms of, you know, when you're lost in a forest, any map will do kind of thing. And so we've been making our way through uh, this pandemic over these number of months, keeping patients and families and our team members safe. I think one of the things without going into any specifics um, in terms of it being a gift is there's a number of things that we have stood up and had to do in terms of that, that, that goal of keeping family, patients, and team members safe, that we will definitely continue once we're on the other side of that. Whether it's how we use a tool like this, we got pushed off the cliff because I think it was the only way, frankly, healthcare was gonna go there and pushed full force into telehealth, like almost overnight. And then the third one I'd say, which we've known for 20 plus years, there's plenty of data to show that productivity is actually better at home than at work we've also been pushed and thrust full force into telecommuting. So about 150 or so of our uh, thousand plus employees have been working from home. And so re, it's re helping us really rethink and Roland had, had a chance to come up and visit shortly after I started. We're really rethinking our capital plan with a much smaller um, footprint in terms of what you really do need for space for both um, clinical as well as administrative space. So I'd say those are some of the the gifts. And those are all sort of more technical things. I think the biggest gift has been the way that we um, have also very rapidly, and for me, and just because of who I am, and I think how I'm wired and how I seek to serve, we have flattened the heck out of hierarchies. Because when you're in a space like this, you have got to rely on everybody's wisdom to, to um, come up with great solutions. Our incident command team, even to this day, still meets three times a week. And until last Thursday, and frankly, and I've said this, I, I truly believe even as of today, we have had no COVID cases among our patients. I'm, I'm fully convinced that the one positive we had last week was in fact a, one of these false positives because the person had it back in the fall. But the guidelines are what they are, so we have to go with it as it is. And that's been a labor of love. We call it hard and hard work. The way that you said, what did you say, how it's knocked us to our knees or how it's, what did you say, how it stinks? What was your, your question, Carrie? Uh, how it- How it's been a mean teacher. Oh, a mean teacher. How has it been? I think the way that it's been a, a mean teacher is um, we've all talked about how, um, what it takes to lead in times of ambiguity. And it's kind of a cool, it's always been sort of this um, academic, uh, cerebral or cognitive thing. Um, you know, when you really are trying to learn how to navigate through a novel uh, virus there, where information is changing and certainly at the beginning of it fairly regularly and having to coordinate between health, public health and your own departments, um, getting comfortable with not knowing everything and not having all the answers um, is the, I think is the way that we win this battle. Um, and I think that's been one of the things that's been toughest for um, a, a number of leaders is you don't have the kind of certainty that you're, you, you think, you actually think, which I think is a little illusory in and of itself that you think that you actually have. So I think that's been one of the, the, the meaner teachers coupled with um, the fact that we are not able to do some of the basic things that um, humans thrive on, you know, touch, being able to hug, being able to be close. Um, and these darn, I almost use the bad word, these masks, not being able to see each other fully and wholly has been, you know, just sort of, I think upended so much of our lives, so, yeah. Thank you, Jandal. Mary. Um, you know, uh, when, what's unique about Evergreen Health is we were uh, ground zero. So February 28th uh, changed our life and everyone, el everyone else's when we had that first positive case at, the at a United States hospital. 
and that thrust the, the small community or this medium-sized community hospital into the limelight. And so, and so I think its gift really was, it allowed each of us at the leadership uh, table to bring something. Um, we were all relatively new to the role. So our CEO, the CMO, the CNO, uh, the CFO uh, had only been here a couple years. We were lucky we had a very stable, uh, uh, good group in our communication and marketing because they were definitely needed as we became that premier site. But it allowed us to form, storm, and norm quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. we all had to learn to trust each other's knowledge, which if uh, with only being there six months and all of us being in our roles approximately six or seven months, you know, that can be a slow train, right? And so it allowed us to quickly adapt and we had to really learn to trust each other. And that continues on to this day. And so I look at it as a true gift, right? It allowed us to be incredibly successful. Um, it really allowed us to design policy for a lot. The CDC was in our, uh, the virus was here on the 28th and we had CDC here March 1st, it was leap year. And so they were on our doorstep steps at 7 a.m. asking us questions we had no reason to ask and I'll never forget this. They told us that anyone who had touched, uh, came in contact with our patients. And at that point we had four diagnosed cases and two deaths that we should uh, furlough all of our staff. And we looked at them and said that would be 780 people uh, today based on our initial look at who had come in contact, we would have to close our doors. And so that really changed uh, the way we looked at this disease and how we were gonna care for our patients. And then I think the third gift is uh, we had backburnered a lot of our staff uh, resiliency and wellness stuff because of budget cuts, as we all do, right? The first thing we all do, and that's not about this organization or any organization, when money gets tight, we start looking at different things. And so we've been able to bring forward back Schwartz rounds and Code Lavender, which is a way to help our staff in times of trauma. Um, it made us really rethink about how we were gonna care for each other as caregivers because we also became the primary caregivers and family, and Janelle, Janelle knows this as well, to every patient. When you allow no visitors, your clinical staff are family members, they are loved ones to, the, uh, to our patients, and so um, it allows us to take care of it. And so I do think that pushed us forward. And, and like, Jandell said, we've been looking for telehealth for years, right? And we've never been able to get it reimbursed. It's amazing how quickly a good pandemic can get you <laughs> reimbursement on things that you never thought you were going to do. I never really thought this as a mean leader. Harsh, yes. And, um, and I, I, I look at that because there were so many gifts in it um, that the harshness comes with, this became very personal. For me, there were nurses and physicians losing their lives, and we actually lost one of our ICU nurses early on in this. And so it became personal, and I felt, you know, deep down. And then because it started out at one of our local uh, nursing homes, I think everyone knows of that. And so it was so mean to that elderly population. When we saw those first few weeks, just all the elderly population, no family to say goodbye to them. It just was such a harsh reality, what a pandemic can do to you. Um, and so, you know, how it's changed healthcare is definitely one of those harsh learnings. And I think the gift is we have become incredibly flexible. It's amazing how we can do a policy how we can change uh, the, uh, the masking guidelines have changed, I don't know, 15 times since the onset of this pandemic. And I, that camaraderie, I think, is still what I will take as the best gift that came out of this pandemic. And yeah. then time with family, our focus, you know, small groups, again, I, I like Jandell, miss hugging my peers, uh, sitting with them after a hard day's work, and yet, I think the nucleus of our family in some ways have become stronger 
uh, with the Zoom meetings, with all of that, it's just different today. And so um, good and bad through this pandemic, certainly in 2020. Wow, thank you so much. Roland, how would you respond? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to add as opposed to be redundant with what Mary and Jandell shared. And I found myself nodding through all of their comments. Um, I know we'll get a little bit more into the business of healthcare and the impacts, but 2020 was a gift in so many ways. I, I will stress pushing us to use technology to connect and, and how it really supercharged that opportunity is, is gonna have a major lasting impact. So that was certainly a big gift uh, for me and, and for anybody that's the work in healthcare. It was also a gift personally for family time, for no commute, for, for enhanced reading time, to, to renew your faith, uh, but also to really relook at your priorities. I think it forced all of us to consider that, especially at work. I think about, I was on a call today with my team from around the country and I said, guys, take care of yourselves take care of your families. Um, our focus right now is on getting as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible, no matter who's their insurance plan. So you guys in your work, because my teams do a lot of long-term planning, right? We, we do 10-year plans because investments in capital and often a hospital campus now will cost well over a billion dollars to, to do a hospital campus, right? And, and so you need about five years runway to plan that and, and you know, get it built and get it done right. And so we're thinking long-term. I said, you know what? We may need to put some of those long-term planning, uh, cognitive capacity, emotional capacities a little bit to the side so we can focus our energy on, on the urgent need at hand, which is to take care of sick people who, who have COVID and to vaccinate as many as we quickly possibly can. And so um, reprioritizing has been for me a big gift coming out of, of uh, 2020. How was 2020 a mean teacher? How does it continue to be a mean teacher? Science-based facts, I mean, truths in general are often disregarded if they don't fit a political agenda. I went out and I bought, I grew up in the eighties in high school. I went out and I bought a book about Ronald Reagan the other night because I'm just so disenfranchised with what's going on in our, in our society. Whatever news station you watch, they're spinning it, right? And look at our political parties and, oh man, I, I long for the days of my youth where uh, our country, I think, valued the fact and, and valued leaders with strong moral character. And so um, the mean teacher from 2020 is I think it's created even more division, not just COVID, but racial tension. And then, you know, and everything that came out from the, uh, what prompted the, the Black Lives Matter movement. And so as a teacher that we as a society have much still to learn on how we treat each other, right? On how we come together as communities. I, I hadn't realized maybe growing up as I did and living in California and Denver. Denver and the Bay Area are so diverse and so welcoming of many different you know, schools of thought and backgrounds that I just, I, I can't imagine in other parts of our country what I observed from the, you know, the news is, was happening. With, with many of those uh, divisions and, and lack of respect for each other. And so it was a mean teacher for me. And I bet a lot of people like me who were just kind of ignorant to what went on, what is still going on. And so that affects me greatly. Um, as an economist, I also learned that the biggest assumption you make as an economist is that people will exhibit rational behavior. And that way you can predict what they might do. There's a lot of irrational behavior out there. You, we really have no idea how people may respond or react to a given set of inputs because um, reasoning sometimes isn't consistent, maybe isn't aligned with what we think would be reasonable. So maybe reason and rational, maybe that's all subjective, which just kind of blows my mind as an economist. That just kind of puts all that social science work out, out the window almost because if you can't count on people acting rationally. And then lastly, I would add, maybe not a mean teacher, but a, a, a real teacher is, is life is fragile. And you know, life is precious. And whether it be, I, I won't speak to some of the drivers of the racial tension, but you think of the people that have lost their lives this last year for whatever reason, at the Capitol, uh, you know, the, the, the people that died at the, at the uprising there, um, um, George Floyd and, and, and you know, in there in Minneapolis, of course, COVID, there's just been a lot of loss of life for various different reasons, which 
is is really upsetting to us as a as a human race, us as a people of, of uh, the the greatest country on earth. So I, I think about those things, and you know, I'm reminded how how far we've advanced, but how far we, farther much farther we have to go. Oh, thank you, Roland. And I know I kind of provided a few questions in advance, but I, I want to react to just everything that you've all three offered. And, and there's a heaviness that I feel in my heart as I'm just taking all of this in. And the question I'm sitting in right now is, given the complexity of the work that you are leading, how have you seen your workforces shift, change, be impacted by all the events of 2020? And how are you managing the healthcare fatigue that we hear about? But I'm not sure we really understand what that looks like. And um, whoever's ready to respond to that, I'll let you go. Not sure we totally know yet. Um, as we are we are losing critical care nurses across the country and in my own organization left and right. So I think we're just beginning to see some of the stages of PTSD, compassion fatigue. And I'm not sure no matter how many resiliency programs or um, debriefs we can have, we'll save, save some of them. Uh, what they have seen is I was a critical care nurse for a lot of years and I had in my career never saw anything like this right and just over and over again and so i'm not sure we actually know the long-term impact of this pandemic on healthcare givers on organizations as a whole right there's been a lot of financial during all this time we're all looking at finances and such because we all a good portion of hospitals stopped doing urgent or non-urgent or in emergent surgery, so not uh, elective surgeries, and that has an impact, impact on the hospital's finances, not counting all the extra PPE staffing and all of that. So I'm not sure there's a good answer for it. It is heavy, right? Whenever you become someone's sole person, and it's still today, right? No visitors come into our hospitals unless you're end of life I call it the beginning of life or end of life, right? That's, those are really the primary exceptions to our visitor policies. On the flip side of that for in 2020, the one thing that has hope, and you will see this as we get vaccines, and I work our vaccine clinic because it gives me hope, mm -hmm. is that vaccine has brought hope. And whether it's the panacea for all, I, none of us know that, right? But it has brought hope in where there has not been light. There has, that vaccine has brought light, especially when giving it to some of the ED nurses, the critical care nurses, these med surge floor nurses who have dealt with nothing but COVID for the last nine months. And so there is hope, right? And so it's going to take a long time for us to recover from this emotionally and physically, I feel. You know, it's um, at the very beginning of this thing, I remember taking a walk and thinking back to, um, you know, a number of the immediate decisions that we had to make around who would go home and who wouldn't, those who, and how we'd manage in particular work from home. I remember that being one of the more defining um, uh, troubling, uh, and I'll, I'll use the word troubling responses from a couple of our executives around how we would manage that. Are we gonna like count their time? So we're not doing it, we're not gonna count time. I mean, we know the day, productivity will be just fine. But I remember being out on this walk and thinking, okay, so what kind of leave will we use if they're sick? You know, all these sorts of things. And I went, you know, Jandal, you know that when you find yourself in this place where you've got, you know, these sort of big decisions to make, you got to go back to your values. So what are the values that you think are going to be so important to managing through this? And, and on that walk, I came um, up with five and uh, was able to talk with the team about it on Monday. And we apply them in different ways, depending and have all, all throughout, but depending on the situation. But there's safety, fairness, equity, trust, and sustainability. And there's different ways that we, as I said, apply those throughout. The interesting thing uh, that's also been sort of this, um, I'll say personal, uh, uh, I don't know, a uh, thing that I ask myself in question is like, so what's really, I mean, it's really called into question, what's the role of a leader? 
you know, servant leader during times like this. You know, the, this is not a technical, the, the, the driver of what your question, um, uh, Carrie is, and Mary, even how you stepped into answering it, it's the, the technical part of this, and I've said this to the team since the beginning, is not the hard part. You know, we can figure out, the, you know, we can, we can flex and do what we have to do with PPE and, you know, as we learn more about the virus, what to do. The hard part of this is the adaptive challenge and the biggest and hardest part of the adaptive challenge, which keeps me sort of not sleeping or having weird recurring dreams of trying to get somewhere and never getting there, frankly, um, is making sure that the teams are fine. Because I think that's out of all the, we got, we've got infection prevention nurses and we've got our safety nurse and we've got our occupational health and safety. We've got executives who know those teams in and out. And, and I chose in the very early days of this to say that the work that um, I think that I'm uniquely positioned to do is to make sure that we're attending to the teams, the people who have to do the work, thinking truly about the social, emotional health and well-being of the teams while doing all that other stuff. It's not as if I sit back and don't have opinions and, and, and help drive decisions in those others. And three of us, our, our head of psychology, our chaplain and I are the, and, and our HR person to a, a lesser extent are the four who have been always keeping that front and center. I've used those very same words, Mary, around PTSD. I think we have, we have no idea what's coming. It may be, you know, if, to the extent that humans are um, innately resilient, that we may bounce back um, sooner than we think, but don't think that we're not gonna see ghosts lurking around corners. Um, you know, as we go forward. What's kept, I think our people, I like to think our teams um, together is that Craig has this phenomenal culture. It is the most patient and family-centered place I have ever worked, ever. And that includes my 24 and a half years at KP. We think about patients and families in some very different ways. And um, we view as leaders, our job is to take care of the folks who have to take care of the folks at that that side are in therapy. And, um, and so when I'm speaking with teams and we have a Zoom call every other week now with the entire hospital and every week with leadership, um, I, I spend a fair amount of time tapping into that part of things because this is a shared trauma. <laughs> Several, as Roland, you point out, shared traumas that we've gone through. And frankly, um, 2021 told 2020 to hold my beer because 21 is off to a rough start as well. And, and so the, the idea through this is to make sure that I'm tapping into it. One of the things last week, real quickly, I'll tell you though, that I, I said is, I, you know, you, you I do the soul searching, what else? What else should we be doing? What else should we be doing? And I said to the team last week, I got nothing. I got nothing. I don't, what, is there something more that we should be thinking about? And in that instant, as we started talking, I said, you know, there is a modicum of this is about, that's about managing your own morale. And so that's one of those courageous things that you have to put out is that there is a part of this that's about self-care. And I've said that all along about take care of yourself and manage your own morale. But to the extent that when I think we're at the end of what more could we do? We've done food, we've done this, we've done that. We've managed to figure out how to adapt the wonderful and fun things that Craig does um, for families and each other over these last many, no, darn near a year. Um, but the, the realization, I had a long talk with our head of psychology yesterday, and I said, you know, I think what we're just supposed to do is sit with it. People mostly right now just want to be heard. You know, we don't have to have solutions. It's the clinician in me. It's the, you know, the sort of notion of what leaders are supposed to do that makes you think there's one more thing out there I'm missing. And, and it's, you know, I think what mostly, when I walk around and talk to folks, which thankfully I get to do, quite a bit, not as much as I used to because of this thing. Um, you know, trying to decrease the amount of people exposing and walk around the hospital. And I talk to patients and families, people seem like, like they're doing okay. And that's because we are all collectively doing about as okay as we can. This is not a unique experience that we're, that any one of us is going to, even though how we adapt to it may be different. So no, um, it isn't clear what's going to happen, but we've laid no one off. We've cut no wages. I said, I will, we will deal with the, the budget and the finances as we need to, but we made a decision. We were not going to add to people's stress and grief by any furloughs or any of that sort of stuff. And nor, more importantly, at a macro and a microeconomic level, add to the, the burden from a community perspective of putting folk on the street especially since all we're gonna to have to do when it's all over is hire them all back anyway. 
And I think people remember that and they're very grateful for that. The, the, I, I didn't by saying the thing that um, someone said to me early on is what, and, and people say it when I walk around the hospital, it's probably one of the greatest gifts. They have no idea what a gift it is to hear this is that thank you for keeping us safe. And when it's all said and done, as we're walking through this, that's, I think that's our job is, you know, harsh lessons sometimes, hard things we have to deliver, but people feel us in terms of that particular rung of Maslow, uh, our, is the notion of safety and security is, um, is really what I think is job one for me anyway. Roland, what would you add? I'll jump while just processing Jandell. I've been learning from Jandell for 15 years now or so, and I, and I continue to. You know, she mentioned she mentioned the five values or truths or those topics she said, Jandell, that you thought about on one of your walks. I know that Jandell gets up way too early every morning, even if it's 10 degrees outside, and goes on a walk in her community. And I get sometimes I get the pictures that she takes of life. <laughs> of spring coming up and the flowers, the crocus, the, you know, the birds, the, the leaves. And, and I just so appreciate uh, listening to Jandell. So I'm the, I'm the non-clinician, right, on this team, this panel. And when you ask the question, how's your workforce doing? My, my honest answer is I have no idea. I, I am in no position sitting in my office every day on my iPad this is my iPad video and I have, my, I have my notebook and I have my iPad. I do use my iPad for the videos. I use my notebook on the side. I, I am in no position to say that I have any idea how our frontline staff are truly coping. And I didn't, I didn't realize how clueless I was until I was talking with one of my staff who's down in Los Angeles. And she also is on the business side, not a clinician. And in LA, as, as many of you know, up until about last week, they had a major surge. ICUs were full. We were turning cafeterias into, into bedrooms. Even some of our non-med surge space, we were converting to ICUs or ICU-like beds. And, and she and her team, and, and they're all vaccinated now, even though they're non-clinicians. Why? Because they're on the front lines doing temperature checks. They're on the front lines trying to, because we're so desperate for staff. And I was talking to her, her name's Laura. And, and this was three weeks back. And, and Laura told me, she said, Roland, I thought it was bad. I, I heard, I read, uh, you know, I, I news, I, I heard word of mouth how challenging it is on the front line to deal with all this illness and death, but you have no idea. It is so much worse than you can even imagine. The morgue, the hospital morgue is overflowing. We have refrigerated trucks on the property, right? To put deceased patients. And, and it was true. I realized I can't comprehend that. And so coming out of it, I think Mary and Jandell are right. We got to be prepared for some serious psychological and emotional damage that this is, right? This is caused with our frontline staff. And I, I love that um, Fielding Graduate University has a big psychology program because I suspect, I suspect that we're going to need more of your graduates. We need those mental health and wellness professionals desperately, not just psychiatrists. We need, we need the psychologists, maybe even more so. Uh, because of the skills that, that they can bring. And so I anticipate a rich discussion here. Maybe it's the last half hour of our hour and a half together, we can have a Q&A. But just talking about how can we as healthcare leaders, you know, learn from you as well through your questions of what are some of the things we can be doing as leaders? Uh, thankfully, I, I can listen, right? I can um, try to be a positive example of hope. I can express appreciation as a leader but in terms of the ability to truly empathize, I can't, there's no way I could fake that. I wouldn't even try. So as we get through this, as we get herd immunity here, hopefully sooner in the summer than later in the fall, uh, we're gonna all need to step back and reassess and reach out and, and give those hugs and, and give people an opportunity to deal with their PTSD because that will be very, very real. And I, I fear that it's gonna be quite extensive. So. You know, I really appreciate how all three of you have brought something to the surface that I don't even know if we've been ready to talk about yet, which is what's it going to look like when this is all over? Because we're still so in it. And you're you're sending a very strong message to us around where the help will still be needed from a mental health perspective. And I, I really appreciate that. 
There are a couple questions that have been raised by members, and I'm just going to read them word for word, and I don't think all three of you have to respond to, to each of these, but I want to name them because they're bringing up some more, some more of these really hard topics. So the, the one question is, typically hospitals focus on patients and clinical care, which they should, but with all the disasters, civil unrest, labor disputes, active shooters, and pandemic, how has healthcare business operations focus changed and how have leaders changed? I think you've all sort of answered this in different ways, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else you'd like to add in reaction to that question. Well, you know, I'll, I'll start in rolling this might, will probably make you laugh. I, we still hear initiative overload. Isn't that the sort of words we heard um, spoken at KP from time to time? And we had started into a 10 year long range plan and um, starting to fill in the blanks of what the five year road um, uh, on the way to that 10 year sort of vision uh, would look like. Last year, we had joint commission, Mary, my first baptism by fire. We did an epic implementation that started in February of last year. We did magnet, we were, it was time for our magnet redesignation. And we had a pandemic on top of that. And then I work in a hospital where um, I am African-American, obviously. And then it's a very, 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 very white place until you get down to people who cook and clean. And, and helping navigate my own emotions at the same time helping a staff who got very much awakened and are people with such amazing hearts sort of deal with, you know, some of what you talked about, Roland, in terms of I had no idea of what privilege really looks like and doesn't look like, you know. So we had all of that stuff going on. We had to put stuff on hold. That's what we did. You know, it, 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 when you're in, because effectively we were in an emergency and you can real easily begin to say what you gotta do and what you don't gotta do. And frankly, magnet, uh, an epic implementation and joint commission is enough to bring anybody to their needs all in one year. Those, you know, the, the convergence of things happen with all these other things. But about midsummer, as we sort of got into whatever was the new normal, for lack of a better word, even though it was still changing, I remember saying to the directors and VPs that, you know, we first of all, I don't think it's good for our souls and our hearts to stay focused on COVID 24 seven or think about when is Joint Commission gonna knock on the door <laughs> or these other sorts of things that we do need some things to bring that can bring us some energy, some excitement. And I think it's time for us to start picking up a little bit of some of that forward looking stuff because when this is over, if we've done nothing about it, we are likely to find ourselves behind. So it had this double whammy of giving people something to think about, you know, that EU stress, U stress, not distress, but just enough um, to, to help us, um, you know, continue to look ahead, um, but not so much that it pushed people over the cliff and it gave them something else to think about, all of us, something else to think about and look forward to back to that notion of hope that there is, there is something on the other side of this that we um, need to think about. So that's, that's how you manage it is you, you get, you get super clear about what you got to do and what you don't have to do. And all of a sudden strategic planning did not, it, it looked like, oh, please. And by the way, your strategic plan is going to change because of what you're going through, yes. yeah. let alone our campus plan, because we were in the midst of a big expansion um, planning, as I've mentioned already. And so, um, you know, that's how you do it. And people are grateful for that. You know, it wasn't, you know, come yeah. off as this driver CEO or president, which of course I'm not by nature, except for, I guess, myself. But anyway, that's how I did it. Yeah. Right? yeah, let me add to that, the reprioritization piece, right? You've got to look at what are you spending your time on? Do you really need to be focused on that? Or is there, are there people dying all around you? Oh, yes, actually, quite literally. And, and therefore, let's give our teams permission to put maybe some of their other work on hold and not feel badly about it and say, hey, you know what? This is what we got to do now. Um, one of the gifts too that I didn't mention from 2020 was we're going through a war zone together and you build relationships with people, right? I, I, one of the things I was asked to do was um, look at all the potential to recover COVID related expenses through the CARES Act, through FEMA and, and through some other channels of, of recovery. And um, it, it turned into a billion plus dollar effort and every morning at 7 a.m., we had a call with this team that I put together, including on the weekends for the first month or so, because we just didn't know 
if this was potentially going to put us out of business. Nobody knew the, the full impact. And so we were saying, okay, guys, we need to do all we can to you know, really assure that we're going to be financially stable coming out of this. And that was a big part of this team's work. And to this day, there's several people I've never met in person that are on that team. We still get together twice a week um, and we do video conferencing, but I've, I've never met most of these people in person. I can't wait to meet them. In person. We're going to have a big event when this is all said and done. We're going to get, I'll get together maybe in Denver. It's kind of the middle of the country and we're going to, we're going to hug and we're going to cry and we're going to celebrate and it's going to be yeah. wonderful. Right. Mm -hmm. So finding joy as you can, how do you lead through all this to your question, Carrie, the question that the person asked, give people an opportunity to focus on the most important things and let them put aside those things that maybe they feel like they need to be doing as part of their, their job description and not worry about those, right. And give them that permission and then find opportunities to celebrate, find, find opportunities to share hope and to share joy. Um, if many people got into healthcare, my wife's a nurse, um, you know, because they want to take care of people. And when you, when you can't have the loved ones in there, right, when you're just dealing with somebody who might be on oxygen, and again, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, I do know that the, our nurses and physicians are truly missing part of what gives them that job satisfaction. And, and so if we could find ways to, to create that or enable that, uh, such that you go on at the end of the day and you don't just feel like, you know, a couple of my patients died today and, and um, you know, they're, they're so sad and lonely because they can't have their loved ones there. Can you imagine you would just own that emotional burden? So how can we help relieve them of that is what, um, you know, I, I'm very sensitive to and trying to do as a leader in my, from my seat. No, thank you both. Mary, I, I, there's another question here, and I was wondering if maybe you could kick it off. It's a hard one, and, and it's one we're all familiar with, but delivery of health care to the minority populations has been subpar at best over the years, and 2020 has really exposed that fact. What do you think is broken in the health care system that causes this type of disparity? I'd be curious to hear it from the nursing perspective. I think it is what we know, right? Lack of insurance, uh, disparities in health, right? Uh, communities. Uh, Washington, uh, Seattle area has a huge homeless population, right? It is a very diverse culture up here compared to where I came from, Colorado. This is a very diverse culture. And yet uh, those disparities of health are still out there. And I think one of the things we learned is, especially early on, is COVID uh, is hard hit on these, uh, some of these populations, right? And so how are we going to provide that care? And I think it was the equalizer in somewhere because you came into our doors with it and you were cared for, right? No one can't question whether you have insurance. I think it's part of the long-term, I don't know that we have the answers. I think it's part of that long-term uh, agenda that we have got to figure out how are we going to care for healthcare Americans and you know my friends at Kaiser actually have done that well in some ways right but um, there are still a lot of people who come in too late right one of the biggest things we've noticed and continue to notice in our is a decrease in emergency volume emergency room volume that concerns all of us right that means there's people sitting at home too scared to come in. Our number of heart attacks has gone down, our number of strokes, there's, it's not normal. And so uh, COVID, whether the pandemic or whether the scarcity of resources, right? I think about uh, California and that scarcity of resource, no matter who you are, is a big game changer. And I don't know that no matter what side of politics you sit on, this is big, right? And this pandemic has uh, put, and the, uh, all the civil unrest has put this in the limelight. And I don't know that I have that answer. All I know as a nurse, when you walk through my door, and I know this is true of Dr. Alan Davis, I'm gonna take care of you like you were my own. And that's just who we are as healthcare providers. It's getting you in my door, right? And that is the harder part. Yep. Let me jump in because I want to share a TED talk of, of someone that, some wise woman who, who gave a TED talk about 
bodies flowing down a stream. Um, so Jendel, heads up, I'm gonna refer to that. Um, we, we certainly as a sick care industry uh, need to make sure that we're colorblind. So anybody who comes in through our doors has access to the same quality care, no matter what they look like. But, but honestly, it's so much more upstream than that. And, and for me, it's three things. It's education. It's the ability to have a good job. I, ideally, it has good benefits, including insurance, and it's access to healthy foods. It's, it's that, um, oh, what's the acronym, acronym of, the, of the organization in, um, in Colorado? Now it's not coming to me, but Healthy Eating, Active Living, HEAL. Yeah. You know, that's an acronym. And so how can we create those types of communities so that the members of those communities have access to good education, which can then enable good jobs with great benefits and then have access and, and enough education to, uh, to be able to take advantage of, of healthy eating and active living. And until we create those opportunities within these diverse communities, um, we're just gonna be reacting to sick care needs. And so it has to be on both fronts from my mind. And, and as this, this person who gave this TED talk uh, reminded us that you know, if you've got, if you've got something um, that just continues to kind of, um, in the, the analogy that was used was, you know, there's people floating down the stream and we're trying to save them because they might be drowning. And, and, and it, all the activity and the resources that went to try to save these people that were going down this river from, from drowning, um, it was becoming worse and worse. And finally somebody said, hey, why don't we go upstream and see why this is happening? and try to prevent it from happening. So, and this was Jan Dell who gave this TED talk. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's what, in addition to saving people that are in the stream already with the sick care, we gotta go upstream and help prevent prevent those those illnesses. I probably didn't do that justice, Jan Dell. It's been a few that's years great. since you gave that, but it was something great. like that. You did great. And, and I think um, the elephant in the Zoom room here is that even upstream from all those social determinants of health in terms of why we're seeing what we're seeing in terms of the disparities why COVID's playing out is, the, is a word that has all sorts of emotional charge, has an emotionally charged nature, nature about it that perhaps now we can say a little easy, more easily since last summer, this is racism. And we can, you know, we can dress it up, and gussy it up, however you wanna put it. And in fact, there are stories and more will come out, I pray. I really do, because I think it's going to be one of the things that's um, so illustrative of the work that we have to do um, post-COVID of, um, you know, poor African-American patients sent home from ERs with COVID. Go home, come back when you're moribund. And that's one of the problems uh, in terms of why we're seeing the illness, you know, sort of delays in treatment. Um, and, and, and right now they're anecdotal, but you got to worry if it's anecdotal, what's really out there. And what's, what's underneath that is not only just sort of the personal biases we may have that, you know, those just don't see as much of anymore. It, this is structural and this is systemic. Um, and, and what's um, both good about that, but also harder about it is deconstructing those systems that have been put in place to sort of keep power imbalances where they are, you know, sort of the structures the way they are. We're not gonna get to the educational and economic opportunities that are absolutely critical to solving the healthcare issues in our country until we deal with, with how we have set up structures that keep the power imbalances and the inequities alive. Again, not work that we get to do while we're in the midst of the crazy that we're in now, but I think back to, if I can use this word, the God things that have happened over this last year. The, I, 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 I do not believe um, I do not believe that um, there is any accident to uh, what how this whole thing is played out. I, I believe God threw a pandemic and Mr. Floyd's murder, let alone Arbery and Breonna Taylor and then, 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 because it's, there's a lot of those, even subsequent to Mr. Floyd's death, uh, let alone the political divide. I think it's all come to this point where we've got some hard looks to take in the mirror. But let's, uh, let's call it. Let's, oh, sorry about that. Um, I am very sorry about that. And it's, it comes up in my computer, no less, it's my cell phone. Um, so anyway, that's not to call it, not to sort of name it and be comfortable naming it and not have 
not not wear it like guilt or shame is one of the other important things that we uh, collectively have got to do in order to get to, to get on the other side of it. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna sorry about that. Thank you. Processing it all. Um, there's one more. Uh, there's a little background noise on um, coming, but there's one more um, hard question. And then I, I, what I want to do is open it up to maybe what you predict and any words of wisdom you'd like to depart to us as a, a graduate university. And, and you can spend that last 20 minutes however you'd like. But the last question that I'd like to just read out loud is, Navajo Nation was hit hard by COVID early and exposed the poor infrastructure in our healthcare system. I always wondered why the U.S. Um, sent our doctors to other countries, but it took this pandemic to finally receive doctors without borders. Any reactions to uh, this participant's statement or question? You know, I spent four years on Navajo um, in the Indian health and so the, the, the pain and the heartbreak and the heartache that our um, indigenous people, our Navajos and other Native American tribes have, have um, uh, endured through this is just another one of those in incredible injustices in our, our country. The, the historical reality, and you know, maybe this is a less than um, uh, helpful answer, is that um, actually Reagan, as it turns out, um, gutted the National Health Service Corps. Mm. Up until that point, doctors like me, people like me who had no money, didn't come from much in terms of means, had a way to get medical school or nursing school or pharmacy school or dental school paid for. And we owed a year for a year. So there was a ready reserve of very high quality physicians and nurses and dentists, et cetera, et cetera, who um, um, had an obligation to do and were on reservations. And so when the core, um, you know, when it became harder and harder to attract and let alone retain physicians and in the Indian Health Service was sort of the start of the unraveling of one of the most phenomenal, I think, care delivery systems in the United States. So um, you've got that. The other though is that the reality is that um, Spatial segregation, or as we like to say, um, social distancing is actually, um, it, it's a point of privilege that not all communities and poor communities for sure don't have. I mean, I live in this house if there's just two of us in here now with kids gone, but I, I can find a room to hold up and if, if um, <laughs> stop it, and why does, and who is this anyway? Um, who, um, I do apologize about that. Um, uh, we can spatially segregate. Um, social distancing is another point of privilege is what I'd say. And that's not something that's possible, but even more um, granular than that, um, we have issues in this country with respect to what you said, Roland, around good jobs and, and steady work. And we have people who, if they don't go to work, they don't get paid. It's as simple as that. We have people who are living so close to that um, cliff um, that they, they, they go to work ill because they have to work, especially in this economy. So we've got those sorts of things. And it gets back to these social determinants that we've got to, um, we're going to have to deal with. Um, or we will continue to see the disproportionate way that folks are being um, uh, impacted, which by the way, for those of us in the space, it was not at all a... Um, it was, you know, when people like shocked, the abject horror on newscasters' faces when they realized there were disproportionate effect, effects of COVID on populations. Those who've been in this space, working in this space for 20 years, KP certainly being one of the leaders in this, it's like, we've known about this for at least two decades, at least when we think about the unequal treatment, which was one of the Institute of Medicine's, either 99 or 2000 was published. So this wasn't a surprise to us. The real the real challenge is what the heck are we going to do about it so we can stop admiring the problem. So it's horrible what's happened on Navajo, just horrible. Um, and um, and it, there's a number of contributing factors now we find ourselves there. Yeah. There's my hope that at some point there's just huge lessons learned 
in all of this and what we've seen, right? Um, from all from all lenses, right? Of how could we have done better and how does it have to change to go forward? We certainly don't want to repeat this history. Uh, whether it's our elderly, whether it's our homeless, whether it's our, you know, not where we want to live. And so I keep thinking, who's going to conduct that big lessons learned? Because gosh knows it is, every one of us has a thousand, as a nation, we probably have millions. And so, and how do we do that? Because um, it would be a shame for not, uh, the for history to repeat this one. Yeah. And I think what you're naming so eloquently is the systemic um, decay. I don't know what the right word is that has to be deconstructed. And that is a call to not just leaders in healthcare, but it's a call to those academics and scholars and practitioners who are trying to be part of the solution. And so I, I think this is a really great way of pivoting to talking about what you predict. And, and while you're talking about what you predict this year or maybe the next couple of years, because reality is it's hard to think past next week sometimes. Like strategic planning that's beyond a year seems just unreasonable. So I'd love to hear what the three of you predict this year. And I'd also love it if you could um, tell us what you need from scholars, graduates, people who are going into the field to be helpers. What do you need and what would be most useful? And Roland, I'll, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Great. This second part of that question, what do we need? All three of us, Mary, Dr. Alan Davis, myself, have noted the, the traumatic impact of our frontline staff having to manage through so much illness and so much death. And so we need a continued appreciation. I, I don't, but our frontline staff, our, our industry needs the, I think the earned respect and appreciation of what nurses and physicians and other frontline caregivers, how much of their lives they've sacrificed, how much of their family time they've sacrificed, how much of their emotional psyche that they're gonna need to repair after this pandemic is over. And, and be a good listener, those that are trained in the field of psychology, which I think, again, right, isn't this, isn't this uh, university have a big program in psychology? Uh, get more, train people quickly and, and, and have them work in healthcare um, for both our frontline workers, but then also our, our patients, our families, you know, and others. So that would be, that would be a request there. And in terms of what does this mean going forward? We are going to have to do a big post-mortem, quite literally, um, and, and learn from why weren't we better prepared as a country. You know, we're a very diverse country in thought. We're not, I lived in Korea for a couple of years, and I've, I've visited other Asian countries, and they're pretty homogenous in so many ways. I, I remember when I lived there, I often would see somebody with a face mask on because they were sick. They had a cold, and they put it on to protect others, especially when they take public transportation. So many people in our country, for whatever reason, I won't get political, determined that they didn't need to do that. They weren't going to be forced to do that. I think that's in large part what has caused, you know, 400 plus thousand people in our citizens to, to, to die, having one of the highest, you know, uh, rates of death due to COVID in our country. Um, and so, you know, how do we fix that? I don't know. I, I don't even begin to know, aside from let's hope we can come together and kind of heal as a people and, and be better listeners and seek first to understand versus defend and spin it to our to our way. But the, the positive, we noted this earlier, but I'm going to share some numbers. One of the positives that's come from this, one of the gifts from 2020, is the ad adaption of technology to connect. Aren't we lucky? Aren't we fortunate that Zoom was pretty much ready for us? Pretty much, not quite. But if this were four years ago, would we have this? Go on, probably not. Um, FaceTiming with, with our kids and the ability to add in multiple different people on FaceTime so we can have this group FaceTime, not just Zoom. And the technology that, that came about just in time for us to leverage it through this, I, maybe to Jan Dale's point, maybe that, maybe that was God given. Um, for us going forward, our, our patients, our members now have had a, a taste of what it means not to have to schedule um, you know, half of your workday to, to drive to your clinic, to wait 
to find parking, to, to walk to wait, you know, to get seen by the nurse to wait, to get seen by a physician to wait, to get what lab work done, to get other work done, maybe an x-ray to wait in the pharmacy and spend half of a day when we've been able to a way to figure out where that can be done virtually. And we can mail you that that prescription and have it in your mailbox within you know two days. Or we we're even doing some day courier service, same day courier service of that. So I think a big positive is going to be th through using technology, we're going to be able to better serve and meet our members' needs, which many of them do not want to come into an, to a medical office building, to a clinic, to a hospital. Of course they don't. To do it in a way that's much more convenient for them, and because we're able to leverage technology, we don't have to have as many expensive investments in, in the things that I do, my teams do, which is investments in, in facilities and equipment. So we're going to be able to reduce the cost of healthcare. We're going to be able to increase the number of insured, and we're going to be able to better meet our members' needs through connecting virtually. Before COVID, depending on looking at some data I got today, before COVID, depending on the region of Kaiser Permanente, um, our members were accessing us virtually maybe 5 to 10% of the time. And when I say virtually, we use the term telehealth um, it includes scheduled virtual video visits and scheduled phone visits, not unscheduled phone visits. Okay, so it's, it's quite different. So it's, a, it's a, an appointment with your caregiver that you scheduled either via video or a phone. Before COVID, 5-10%. Peak of COVID, 70 to 80%. Still, I'm looking at Northern California's numbers, 40% of our visits are face-to-face. -face. This is through January 23rd year to date, right? So first 23 days of this month, 40% face-to-face, 35% telephone, 25% video, 60% still of our of the visits that our physicians and our nurse practitioners and other providers are having for our members are done via technology. And we predict that may, may not continue at 60%. If that stays at 40% uh, percent or so, we, we have a chance to, again, drastically improve access and reduce the cost of healthcare. And that, that excites me. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you, Roland. Um, Mary, what about you? You know, uh, Roland mentioned uh, about the long-term impact, and I think it is our bedside care caregivers, but we have been running on this high level of energy at all levels. Uh, I, I was thinking of Jen Dell when she says she wakes up as this dream right? We all have that no matter who is been tied. And it's not just hospitals. It's just not all medical groups. I think about the Department of Health here, those people who are running out the vaccine, the, you know, how are we taking care of them? I think there's some unforgotten caregivers in all of this that are out there. And then I think it's really asking not how are you, but how are you emotionally? I mean, I've started asking that of my nursing teams is when I'm meeting it with a nurse, how are, when I say, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. No, I want to know how you are emotionally. You're like, what else, you know, where are you? I mean, I don't know that we're going to get over this easily, as I said at the beginning, um, but until we start asking the hard questions and as you have coaches and et cetera out there, you're, you're the ones who are going to help us long term. This isn't going to be fixed in the next year, right? This is a long term uh, project for someone. And so I'm looking forward to some of the research that's going to come out because it'll help us um, in the end. And then where do I think we'll end in 2021? You know, as someone who's stuck in day to day operations, right? I'm hoping for herd immunity, right? I, I think. It, and to recreate our business. And it is nice, Jen, they'll mention, we're now starting a strategic plan again. It's almost a blessing, right? To talk about something else. Yes, we're gonna buy some more Da Vinci robots, right? Uh, I, and so it's hard to get excited about that, yet we have. And so um, I think for your scholars, et cetera, um, the innovation, going back to what Roland said, Telehealth has come a long ways. You know, what are the next steps that we need that we can ha truly have a medical home, right? What else do we need besides just good, really good home care? What does that really look like? Um, so we're going to have to address the healthcare worker shortage at some point. This has made the healthcare worker shortage even worse than it was predicted. We're losing nurses at an extremely high rate as well as our EDS workers. Don't forget, there's a lot of people who help us take care of patients throughout this. 
and we're losing them too because of this pandemic. So keeping that in the forefront of how we become innovative. Um, it's what I'm challenging myself with. And then how do we build um, our resilience in healthcare back up after something like this? Um, we're naturally resilient, but I think we've taken a little bit of a hit. Thank you, Mary. Jandal. So, um, you know, first thing I want to say is, is to you, Mary, and certainly Roland, through whatever channels to the true frontline workers of this pandemic is thank you. I mean, we are blessed to be in the post-acute world and must seem weird to say, maybe we had one case last week when, you know, you all are working in a, and, and we view that as, you know, both, wow, you got this far without any cases, but almost sort of with some disappointment, but also with some relief, because we've been holding our breath for a long, long time, wondering what it would be like on the other side, and we survived and the sun came up. But all of that said, I want to thank you, because our teams are very, very much aware of our challenges being very different, whereas you, you are, we have a different sort of line of defense in the post-acute world than what, in terms of what you all are up against. And, and I cannot imagine to the point you made, Roland, what it would be like. I think about my OB colleagues who go into the hospital every day and think how, how different an experience that must be for them. So thank you for what you all do. So here's my Debbie Downer belief. And you said, what do, what do you think 21 holds? I think 21 is going to look very much like 20. I, I don't have the same... Um, level of confidence that we're going to either reach the levels of vaccine that we need to get herd immunity much before the end of the year. Um, I think the economic impacts of what we're seeing are going to last us, frankly, sadly, into 23. I mean, Rowan, well, you're the real economist here, but in terms of when we're really going to be able to say, yeah, we're on the other side of this, there's so much rebuilding. Here in Colorado, a thousand small businesses have completely gone out. They're gone. They're gone. So what does rebuilding look like on the other side of this? I think in healthcare, um, and had a chance to talk about this with the, you know, with the, with the Fed is around workforces. Um, there are people who are going to walk away from healthcare and not come back. You know, we know that. And so whatever's been the shortages where we've been able to put nursing right up front, I think physician shortages could, you know, potentially uh, be a real deal. And it's going to be an acute shortage. It's not that, you know, sort of there's this. Uh, waning way that we'll see numbers, people are going to walk away and, and, and need to do something differently. Um, so I think there's that. I think hospitals have a lot of work to do to recover, whether it's financial or even how they reorganize. And, and, the, and the, the real vulnerability that I think hospitals that are not a Kaiser Permanente, um, where we own both the utilization and the revenue side of the equation. See, I still say we. Um, <laughs> after 24 and a half years, you better say we, but, um, so, so I think that there's a lot, there's a lot that's out there that's still going to be there, but I think we're going to be fighting this for some time. And the other part that we have no idea about is, um, are we, in fact, is COVID now here to stay and part of what we're going to have to contend with? And given the way that it entered, when we see these brush fires back to PTSD, either within a small community or not so small community pops up, especially the variants, and got to quickly figure out um, you know, when vaccines need to be adjusted or, uh, or changed, how we respond to it. Um, how do we not let ourselves um, get caught up in the anxiety and the fear uh, the, that this level of uncertainty has engendered, not just in the United States, but everywhere. So it's kind of Debbie Downer, but I think what's different, and it's what we said last week when we had this um, case, is we have, as you said, Mary, oh my gosh, our um, decision trees have decision trees, right? We've got policies galore that we've set up to keep us safe. And it was one of the things that I had to remind the teams, we know how to get through this. We've got, we've got all the things we need. And more importantly, we have you to help us um, sort of navigate this next part of things. So there's a sign when we come down from the mountains, um, Carrie and Roland and uh, Mary, remember the yellow signs when you're coming down Evergreen? There are people now, and when we're on Zoom, that have um, found the photo and they have it up behind them because I've told them, guys, truckers, you're not down yet. 
we still got, you know, some steep turns and some, you know, some, some uh, 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 sharp inclines and sharp turns that we're still gonna have to make through this. And, um, and so this is not the time to either get sloppy or um, grow impatient. Because if we do, we're just going to we're going to prolong, yeah. um, you know, sort of the the, the rescue, as it were. So, um, I think the best thing, or the this most sagely advice I can give our teams is just to hang in there because we're not done yet. And then I think Mary, you nailed it in terms of what I think we're going to need from the academics is people to help us really deconstruct what the hell we've lived through, um, you know, because it, it's a it's a sociologically interesting and I was a sociology major in college of all things sociologically it's very interesting when you can step back and watch this because of the convergence of politics and policy and the ambiguity of an unknown novel virus and racism and how all these social um, issues have come together to place us where we are now and so we'll, we'll see but I think we've got at least another year and a half if not longer to go in terms of all of it before we really start to see the economy and this virus on the wane. There's right. some great there's some great doctoral thesis papers there, some research papers that uh, many of those are that are maybe not on the phone if this is more the graduates, but those that are still working towards their graduate degrees have an incredible source of an opportunity to study. So please study it and then let us learn from you. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. And I, I think what I'm sitting with, and I, I, I think I can speak to a lot of the listeners, is I'm just so grateful for all three of you being in your leadership roles. You know, what you brought to this panel was some sense making around what the lived experience really is um, leading in this work. And, and Jandel, I think that was a beautiful metaphor. You know, in Colorado, you think you're down the mountain because all of a sudden you hit a plateau and then you speed up. And then before you know it, you are like running downhill fast in a speeding vehicle. And um, we need to be pacing that this is not over yet. We're not down that mountain. And I think too, what I hear from all of you is the values driven leadership. And I know the three of you are not alone. I think that so many servant leaders, conscious leaders, authentic leaders are drawn to service industries like healthcare. And I know we're losing them to COVID and sometimes we're losing them to burnout. And so I think when I hear you say, keep the love poured, I, I wanna make sure we're not getting desensitized. Like we get numb to it. This is just how we live. And such a great gentle reminder that um, where we support has not, um, the need has not diminished whatsoever. Um, I'm so grateful for all three of you. I'm grateful that you're leading and I'm grateful that you are looking to academia and scholars to not just theorize what's happened, to, to, but to really be practitioners in partnership with those in healthcare. And we're ready. I think many of us are ready to um, continue to support uh, do the research, do the study. Um, it's certainly not something that can be done in a year, but there's there's definitely an appetite to be of service. And um, you've helped create that spark a little bit brighter tonight. And so I'm just so thankful. I, I guess that's the word I'm leaving with. And maybe I'll ask you, um, the three of you, to. we like to do the one word checkout. What's the word that you're just sitting in right now, having been part of this conversation? And Mary, I'll start with you. You know, it's been my word uh, since December 23rd when our first shipment of vaccine came in, hope. Mm -hmm. There is hope. It's one of the things I learned working for the Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth, hope. Roland. Yeah, I was thinking hope as well, but I don't want to use that word. Um, maybe clarity. But, you know, you know we're, we're understanding where we are, where we're not, what we need to do. That there's clarity of purpose. And I actually think we have a, a clearer path forward right now with the vaccine getting rolled out than we've ever had. So I'd say clarity. Excellent. And for me, it's connection. Mm -hmm. I think the way we've made our way this far has been, if there's a universal, it's this shared experience. And the thing that keeps me in the game, although I worked from home today, which is incredibly rare, is being able to have a place to go to where I feel like I'm part of a community. So it would be connection. And now we have this community. Yay. 
<laughs> you definitely have the Fielding Graduate University community, and we're so pleased that you're here. Um, for those listening, thank you. Uh, I have to imagine that you're feeling just as full as I am and grateful um, for this opportunity to hear the experts in the field. And I want to wish you all um, a blessing of health and safety as you go back into your work, especially you, Mary and Jandell, who are walking hospital corridors daily. Um, prayers for health and safety to your team. Roland, you oversee a huge operation and continued health and safety for you, your family, and your team. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Have a wonderful evening and have a wonderful week. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.